Hi, my name's Benji, and welcome to Dice vs. Cards. Today we're looking at in-between, and we're going to find out if area control and two-player card games can go hand in hand. We're also going to find out if this game of push and pull knows how to balance itself from start to finish. And finally, and most importantly, we find out whether the characters of Stranger Things playing a game of Tug of War can provide you with E for Entertainment. So let's see how this plays and whether this could be the next game for you. The object of the game for the creature player is to devour enough humans or to spread awareness of their terror. And similarly for the human player, they need to secure enough of the humans in the upside view or spread awareness of the creature's existence. You'll set up the character cards in a circular fashion and alternating them between the human and the creature dimension. You'll also start with five energy cubes each that will help you play the cards. You start with three in your opening hand and then you're good to go. So each player turn is broken down into four phases and the active player marker will track whose turn it is with the blue side being the human player and the red side being the creature player. The first phase is the awareness phase and this is where you can use your once per game ability dependent on what level of awareness you've raised your counter to. You then take your action phase and this is where you can choose one of three available actions. The first of which is to play a card from your hand. So there are symbols and numbers on here. This top left symbol is where you're going to have to match symbols found on the character cards. Because the idea being that the game starts with all characters in the in-between. But the more you play cards that match symbols on the character cards, the more you're able to sway them to your side. So for example, the human player could play Florit. Because the interstate symbol can be found on Jeremy here. And because Jeremy's already in the human dimension, you'll add one of these counters here that will indicate that they're becoming more and more secure in the upside view. But similarly, the creature player could have played a rage card, also on a character here, Carl, in the human dimension. And that's important because whenever they're in the in-between, i.e. they've got no counters on them, you can then flip them to the other dimension if you're the one trying to do that. So instead of directly influencing a character when you play a card, you can also place a token of that symbol on a character that doesn't already have it. So for example, Natalie here. After you've done one of those two things, you can also then activate the ability on the card, where the energy cost is in the bottom left hand corner, and you follow the instructions accordingly. The remaining two actions are to rest, where you gain a number of energy cubes equal to the number of characters in your dimension. You then move to the activity phase, and this is where you'll check where the active player marker is, and regardless of whose turn it is, if that character is in the in-between, then nothing will happen. But if that character has counters on it, then depending on whether that character is in the human dimension or the creature dimension, that player will increase their awareness by one. Furthermore, if there's more than one counter on a character card, that character's ability with the text can be found in the bottom will also take place. Finally, you'll then finish the turn with the movement phase. And this is simply where you move the active player marker and flip it to the next character card. And the game always starts with this marker going clockwise, but some game effects can flip that round. So that's how this game plays. What did I think of it? So what's good about the game? Well, I don't normally like to start with theme, but considering the size of the box, it's got such a wonderful vibe and presence to it. That despite the somewhat obvious giant shadow that the Stranger Things franchise and its likeness brings to bear. The looming threat of the upside that Sorry, the in-between, or whatever the duckbill platypus it's called, is so well presented here, it's a testament to the fact that theme can not only be evoked largely by artwork and production, but it can also be delivered in a small package. But a game can't succeed on style without any substance at all, right? <laughs> Sorry. Do not fear though, ladies and gentlemen, there's definitely some substand and s here. 
The fact that the game does a decent job of delivering the illusion of end-to-end -end asymmetry is a nice touch. The core mechanics remain the same for both sides, but there's some subtle twists in the way each player's cards of both the event and character variety function and ultimately play out. It's these bells and whistles that elevate a somewhat perfunctory turn sequence that's all about forward planning and elevate that to something quite tasty indeed. Finally, it's worth noting that there's an upside to that oh so simple turn sequence in that the game can whiz along at quite a nice pace while still retaining a sense of tension and engagement in everything that's going on. The push me, pull me nature of each turn gets you really invested in the outcome of your endeavours. The characters themselves coming to light in the form of their abilities any time you give them a cuddle or the fright of their lives. Resulting in a game that at first might feel a bit throwaway, but ultimately has you caring about the Tones folk in this here story. Which encourages you to put your best foot forward at all times to try and win the game. So what's not so good about the game? Well with such a linear embodiment of tug of war going on, it's extra important that should a player strike the first blow and gain advantage, that it doesn't become a case of slowly winning more until the inevitable conclusion of battle. The main reason for that is the ability for said person to strangle their opponent's economy, which can often result in the beginning of the end seemingly taking place quite early in the game. What you of course don't want to happen in mechanical terms is for an immovable object to meet an unstoppable force, but more tempo normalising abilities would certainly have been welcome. Finally, there's more than one minor half cooked idea or something that comes across as an afterthought on display here. The most notable being the once per game awareness abilities. This is certainly a minor quibble as all of the game is functional but just one area that felt ripe for improvement. When all said and done I was definitely charmed by a game that as an overall package exceeded my expectations after having read the rules. Of course it's area control light but I was impressed with the way this was presented alongside the card play. I do think the swingy nature of the game is its primary issue, but its strong theme and the immersive experience it provides were enough for me to look at the game with a glass half full. So with all that being said, Dice vs Cards are going to give a final score of 7.5 out of 10. If you're in the market for a two player tug of war card game with exceptional theming, then look no further than this little fella. The Public Health Secretary has just released a statement reminding everybody that the health benefits of playing board games are far superior than binge watching TV series.